consequence of a well-known feature of quantum theory, the quantum Zeno effect, about which we were going to be hearing more. The absolutely key point here is that although the mental effort has, within the theory, a well-defined effect upon the physical aspects of nature, the choice of whether or not this effort will be exerted is not determined by any known law, statistical or otherwise. This choice of whether or not to exert effort is, in this very specific sense, a free choice. Quantum mechanics in its present orthodox form has this causal gap, which provides a perfect place for the entry of choices that are not determined by the physically described aspects of the world, but that can nevertheless influence the physically described aspects of the world. This causal gap is filled by voluntary attention. This causal gap is a gap completely different from the causal gap that is partially filled by the statistical rules of quantum mechanics. I now begin to fill in the technical details of how quantum mechanics integrates mind and matter. And now we come up to a key point. I want to just remind everyone that Henry worked very closely with Werner Heisenberg, the founder of the uncertainty or indeterminacy principle. So it's, it's, it's not just anyone who is about to give you now a very nice, clear-minded, for biologically oriented people description of the uncertainty principle, but rather from a person who worked closely and co-published with Werner Heisenberg. The key underlying difference between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. In the present context, this principle asserts that at the basic irreducible level, one must replace the classically conceived, precisely defined trajectory of the center of mass of any object, large or small, by essentially the statistical distribution of classical statistical mechanics constrained by the condition in each of the three dimensions that the product of the uncertainty in the velocity times uncertainty in the position can be no smaller than a certain number, namely Planck's constant divided by the mass of the object. As in classical mechanics, one treats planets and atomic particles in essentially the same way, but in quantum mechanics one uses in all cases the measured value of Planck's constant, approximately 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 27th in CGS units, whereas in classical mechanics, one uses instead the value zero. The value zero allows the position and the velocity of the object to be simultaneously well-defined whereas the true measured value does not allow this. There is a huge difference in principle between 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 27th and zero. But because in the dynamics of the solar system, no appreciable difference is generated by the difference between these two numbers, scientists built classical physics on the then reasonable idea of well-defined trajectories. But extrapolating this invented idea of classically conceived well-defined trajectories of planets to the level of the ions participating in neural dynamics leads to something very different from what is obtained by extrapolating from planets to ions with the use of the measured non-zero true value of Planck's constant. The uncertainty conditions on ions 
can have a major impact on neural dynamics. The basic structure of orthodox Heisenberg von Neumann quantum mechanics is very simple. The primary reality is a sequence of psychophysical events. Each such event has a psychological aspect and an associated physical aspect. The connective support that links these events together is a field of potentialities that determines the objective tendencies expressed in terms of probabilities for specific psychophysical events to occur. For, for what did I say? Spe for specified. I, I said specific? Yes. Okay. The connective support that links these events together is a field of potentialities that determines the objective tendencies expressed in terms of probabilities for specified psychophysical events to occur. This field of potentialities is represented like the physical properties of classical physics by mathematical properties attached to space-time points and except at the times of the events, it, it evolves continuously in accordance with a deterministic equation of motion called the Schrodinger equation. That is a natural generalization of the classical equations of motion. Does anybody want me to read that last sentence again? No. Okay. <laughs> then I assume you all understood it the first time. But the key point is this. I didn't. I'm just that, and I'm, I don't want to be a, use a psychological projection there, but I admit I didn't understand that the first time. But the key point is this. Before an event can occur, a specific question with a yes or no must be posed. With a yes or no answer, a word I left out. He left out, not me, him. Okay. <laughs> but the key point is this. Before an event can occur, a specific question with a yes or no answer must be posed. But there is in contemporary orthodox quantum theory no rule, statistical or otherwise, that determines what this question will be. This lacuna is important because it allows the dynamics to be influenced in the end by things other than the prior physical state of the universe. Once a specific query is posed, nature responds with a definite yes or a definite no in accordance with definite statistical rules. But what the next question will be is left open. Orthodox quantum theory requires then that before any experience can happen, a particular question must be asked. But it does not determine which question will be posed. The standard ideas of neuroscience assert that what we experience is determined by selective attention. As stated already by William James, involuntary selective attention picks out an initial experience, but then voluntary attention associated with conscious effort can hold this thought in place. Using, using the rules of quantum mechanics, using the the mathematical rules of quantum theory, and that's the point. This is all not just conjecture, this is how the rules work. I mean, it's, it's unambiguous. Right. The, the voluntary attention associated with conscious effort can hold this thought in place as required by and, and, and entailed by the rules of quantum mechanics. Well, the rules of quantum mechanics does it, and uh, uh, James said, really, this is what we need. Okay. Holding the idea of an action in place can cause the occurrence of that action to become more likely than it would have been if the conscious effort had not been made. These connections can be described within the classical physics conception of nature, but they cannot be explained. They cannot be explained because the classical theory leaves consciousness out. Moreover, setting Planck's constant 
equal to zero in quantum theory reduces to zero the range of uncertainty within which the physical effects of our conscious efforts act and that reduction eliminates all physical effects of consciousness. Let me just elaborate on that. I mean, this is very interesting and important. The point is, you can, uh, you can look at quantum theory and... You can look at quantum theory and uh, just uh, set the Planck's constant equal to zero to see what you get. And what you get is that it just removes all traces of consciousness. <laughs> Uh, it removes uh, the places where consciousness can enter, and it removes the possibility that consciousness can do anything. So you actually see the uh, why classical mechanics doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't work in explaining consciousness. You have made an approximation by setting to zero something that's not zero, and uh, that approximation essentially removes consciousness from the theory. So. Uh, from that point of view, it's, it's obvious that you shouldn't use uh, a, a false theory which has eliminated consciousness to explain consciousness. Section now titled Template for Action and the Quantum Zeno Effect. We're up to the last two sections of the paper now, two brief sections. Qu template for Action and the Quantum Zeno Effect. Any action takes time and depends on a timed sequence of neural signals being generated. It is therefore reasonable to assume that for each planned and executed action there is some pattern of brain activity which will, if held in place for a sufficiently long period of time, tend to generate that action. It is also reasonable to support that involuntary selective attention responding to informational, it is also reasonable to suppose it is also reasonable to suppose that involuntary selective attention responding to informational clues about and acting within a brain honed by prior experience will tend to activate the template for an appropriate action. However, the stochastic activities in a warm living brain have a strong tendency to disrupt any highly structured pattern of brain activity. So there may be a large probability that an appropriate template for action would dissolve before it can produce the associated needed action. It would therefore be evolutionarily advantageous if a high level evaluative process could be linked to a process that could hold a highly valued template for action in place for an extended period of time in the face of strong disruptive physical tendencies. The quantum Zeno effect is well known and well understood quantum effect. The quantum Zeno effect is a well-known and well-understood quantum effect. If a yes response to a query occurs, and this query is immediately followed by a sufficiently rapid sequence of very similar questions, then the probability is nearly one, or unity, that nature will continue to answer yes. Under these conditions, the physical system becomes controlled by the questions freely posed instead of by the prevailing physical dynamics. Because within contemporary orthodox quantum theory, our queries are not controlled by the physical aspects of nature, and because our voluntary attention appears to us to be controlled by our consciousness, it is not unreasonable to postulate that a person's voluntary attention is, in fact, directed by that person's conscious aspect, and that conscious effort increases the rate at which the associated queries are posed. These assumptions allow consciousness to be rescued from causal limbo to which, what, to which it was consigned by classical mechanics and installed as the causally effective player that it appears to us to be. Concluding. Ion channels. Ion channels are critically important. The physical structure of ion channels are critically important to why we must use quantum mechanical dynamics in understanding mind-brain interface. Ion channels and brain dynamics. 
I have mentioned the fact that while the quantum uncertainties have only negligible effects at the level of the dynamics of the solar system, they have large effects on brain dynamics. One such large effect stems from the geometric structure of the ion channels that provide the pathways through which ions flow through cell walls into nerve terminals. These ion channels are large molecules, atomic weight approximately 200,000 Dalton, with a narrow passageway through which flow some kind of ions, let's say calcium ions, but this applies equally to sodium and potassium too because th that is very important. It's not just calcium ions. The, 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 the potassium ion channel is even narrower than the calcium ion channel. The key point is that the structure of the ion channels for sodium, potassium, calcium, and other ions too, I am almost sure, are very narrow, a nanometer or less. The diameter of the passageway is less than a nanometer. This is small enough to produce in the motion of a calcium ion a large departure from a well-defined trajectory during its passage from the exit to from the exit to the ion channel to the vicinity of the triggering site where it participates in the release of neurotransmitter molecules into the synaptic cleft that separates the neuron from its neighboring neuron this quantum smearing of the pertinent positions of the calcium ions injects a quantum uncertainty into the release of the vesicle of neurotransmitter. In a highly nonlinear system, such as a brain, that contains a lot of releasable free energy, small differences at the micro level quickly evolve into gross macroscopic differences. Thus, one must expect in the absence of any quantum collapses that the state of the brain should generally evolve into a state that is a quantum mechanical mixture of macroscopic components containing more than one template for action. For example, if you are walking in a dark forest and a shadowy form jumps out of the darkness, your brain could quickly evolve into a state that could include both a template for fight and a template for flight. But you must do one or the other, not both. The quantum resolution of the conflict involves first an involuntary attentional selection of one of the two templates and its associated thought, either fight or flight, followed perhaps by a conscious effort to actualize that action. If this consciously directed effort does occur, then that template will be held in place for a while, which can cause that action to occur. The conscious effort will then have actually caused, by its activation of the quantum Zeno effect, the intended physical action to occur. This general quantum theoretical model of how consciousness causes bodily effects seems to work well in all the cases that we have examined. And I now will discuss several empirically studied neuroscience examples. So I, I mean that, okay, does anybody ha want to ask Henry any questions or comments or anything? How would his theory be repeated? How is it testable? No, he's saying how, how do you apply Popperian philosophy of science to the quantum mechanical um, worldview? Uh, well, as you know, uh, Popper worked cl closely with uh, Eccles, Sir John Eccles, and uh, they in fact wrote a book together trying to and um, uh, uh, address uh, these issues. Um, Eccles developed that point of view uh, in connection with these very things we're talking about right here, about the effect of uh, 
uh, well, um, Popper has these different types of um, worlds. And uh, so Eccles developed this theory in order to make a relationship between the uh, essentially the experiential world and the physical world. And he did it exactly in terms of these ion, uh, these releases of the, uh, uh, of his analysis of the brain in terms of uh, uh, his work evolving eventually into the question of uh, the release of neurotransmitter at, uh, at these nerve terminals, the very thing we've just been talking about. Uh, now, Eccles thought that he had to modify quantum theory in order to uh, uh, account for the uh, effectiveness of conscious will. Uh, his idea was that the um, will modified quantum theory. It changed the quantum mechanical rules in some way. Uh, now this would have very dire effects. Quantum theory is a very delicately uh, constructed theory and if you uh, try to modify the statistical rules in any way, you can produce all sorts of very weird effects uh, which do not seem to uh, appear in nature. So uh, the point I'm making here is, is, is exactly tied to um, Eccles' uh, uh, endeavor to uh, fit his to fit physics or neuroscience into uh, into the Popperian worldview, and uh, the point I'm making is that uh, you don't need to modify the rules of quantum mechanics. The rules of quantum mechanics actually, uh, by themselves, naturally accommodate um, this uh, effort to tie the mental worlds and the physical worlds. Uh, together, so I'm not sure if that really answers your question. But. Okay, I, and I can I know why you're shaking your head. I mean, did, I mean, and I'm not I don't want to put you on the spot here, but did did you know that that Popper worked so closely with Eccles? Because I know, and I <laughs> you, you you picked the right guy to ask. If you want to know afterwards, I'll tell you how to ask that question to make it harder to answer. But but it's it's actually pretty easy to answer the way you asked it. But um because 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 Popper did work so close with Eccles, I mean he would be completely on our side. You could pick other people who I'm not going to tell you until after we're done who wouldn't be as easy. But but um. The, I think the issue is this, that, that basically if I'm hearing your question properly, you're basically saying, hey, that sounds great, guys, but how could it be falsified? Because, you know, by my deep understanding of Popper's philosophy of science, if it's not falsifiable, it's not science. So if I understand you, you know, with my psychotherapy experience and everything, that's probably the gist of your question. And, and so um, the, the, the point is basically that the, the description that Henry is giving um, flows right out of orthodox quantum theory. So there's no like hard mumbo jumbo sort of new thing. We call it staff, but that's why we're stressing Heisenberg, von Neumann, Pauli. I mean those three, you know, right up front. I mean, so this, they, they all were completely behind everything we've said t today, essentially. Um, may not have said it as succinctly as this, but it, this is not new. This is orthodox. And, and so your question rapidly becomes, how do you, what's, what makes quantum mechanical theory falsifiable? And that's an easy question to answer because there's, you know, 75, 80 years of data, the predictions of quantum mechanics. I mean, the one thing everybody agrees on, even those who are opponents of, you know, this kind of theory that the way we're expressing it in an orthodox way, there are non-orthodox ways of trying to make to get consciousness out of quantum theory. They've been trying to get consciousness out of quantum theory since the founders put it in there because they had to. So at the issue of the level of falsifiability, you're basically saying, well, how do you falsify quantum mechanics? Well, that's an easy question to answer. Show us some data where it's making false projections. They've been doing that for almost a century now. There are no such projections. There are no such empirical findings that, that um, are at variance with the predictions of quantum physics. So, so what it really comes down to is quantum physics holds as a scientific theory for 
you know, a good 80 years. There's an you know, incalculably large amount of predictions that have been tested using it. It clearly works. It's had a uncountably large opportunity to be falsified. It never has been falsified. And 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 the mind brain theory that this that Henry is, is basically just elaborating on now, which was also held by Heisenberg, Pauli, and, and, and um, well, let's just leave it at, at, at Heisenberg and Pauli and von Neumann, okay? It just follows right out of the theory. So, thanks for the question. Okay. That took practically an hour, and I mean, I remember like, you know, after an hour I was going, hey, I've had it, you know, so. I don't know if you've had it or not. Um, but I'll, sh I'll just show you some neuroscience. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to do like my whole presentation. because I mean, you know, I made like an editorial choice with Henry. I mean, I thought that was important. We wanted to do it, and we did. So I'm just going to show you some experiments so that it's not just a lecture on physical theory. Um, OK, so is there a pointer? There must be a pointer. Here we are. It's a pointer. OK. So this is, you know, Escher. I made a little mock-up here. I've used this a lot of times. Um, it's Escher, basically, you know, but making this famous two-handed diagram being the mind and the brain. And of course, the classical view is basically that everything about the mind is created by the brain. We're now hopefully pointing out to you that that's only part of the story, but we're also being very specific about what we mean by mind here. Because by mind we mean the volitional effort of attention, and especially the volitional effort of attention to pose the same query, which as you're going to see in neuroscience, in, in functional neuroscience terms, really translates into make repeated observations, which really translates into focus attention, and I coined a term to go along with Henry's term, um, uh, action template. The, the, the other side that goes along with action template is what I, a term that I came up with, which I call attention density. So attention density is basically observations per unit time. As you focus your attention more, we're basically supposing that you're making more observations per unit time. It's the amount of observations per unit time, when that increases, that is what makes the quantum Zeno effect come into play to hold the action templates in place. So that really is the, 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 the neuroscience relevant psychic dynamic of that. When you increase your attention density, you will call into play or activate the quantum Zeno effect, which will then hold in place the action templates, which for all intents and purposes we can understand as classical neurophysiology calling into play. So now you see a way where we can take the whole body of work, you know, from Sherrington on, from before Sherrington on. And I myself am really very, I, I believe Sherrington would be very supportive of what we're talking about here today. And I wrote about that in my book, The Mind and the Brain. Um, and we can take the classical functional neurophysiology um, of the entire 20th into the 21st century and, and just use it to understand how these action templates get generated and then we're just adding into the dynamic this, this fact of quantum Zeno effect being called into play by increased attention density, by focused attention, which then allows the action template to become functionally actualized. So there have now been uh, you know, quite a few, very many as a matter of fact, just fMRI studies, which are actually straightforward applications of this. Then you can get into the sociological question about why the, you know, the young and upcoming scientists, and some of them are more than just upcoming now, some of them have arrived. I mean, I'm going to show you some uh, experiments by Matthew Lieberman, who's at UCLA. I mean, you just can't call him up and coming anymore. I mean, he's like, a young star, and but he doesn't want to go here. Not really. I mean, one of the one of the reasons you know it's so important to come and address you know an audience like this is I'm trying to we're trying to create a change in the sociology of science so that the young investigators 
who are now quite established, who want to, you know, be on good terms with the National Institute of Health. The National Institute of Health absolutely represents the dynamics of classical physics as being the sole cause of, of all observed data in neuroscience. We're obviously saying that's a bad mistake because of, of the kinds of data I'm going to show you right now. And I'm just trying to say it would be nice if we could get to the point where some of the cognitive neuroscience that has, there have been some quite good studies, at least I hope you're going to think they're good studies, have been done and try to explain, well, you know, what's the role in consciousness in those findings? These dynamics allow you to answer that question rather than what they do now, which is basically leave the question totally unaddressed and operate on the unstated assumption of what Popper called promissory materialism. Promissory materialism being the position that just keep that funding flowing and we're going to figure out how materialist classical physics figures all of this out. That's called promissory materialism, a term that was coined by Karl Popper. Um, I don't know whether to do my own stuff. It's like too old. I, let's just get right down to like better, newer cases. This, okay, this is um, I'm going to run through this data like on the fair.